So former Ravens defensive end Derek Wolf's time in Baltimore came to a screeching halt over the summer after he and the organization agreed to an injury settlement. Yeah, it was definitely an abrupt end to what was otherwise a disappointing 14-game stint in Baltimore, which all came during the 2020 season. But Bobby, you caught up with Derek recently, and he had some significant things, and that's putting it lightly, to say about what led to his premature retirement from the NFL. All that's still to come. I'm Bobby Trossett with Sarah Ellison. It's Friday, December 9th. And this is your Morning Ravens Vault. Well, Greg Roman's bid to become Stanford's next head football coach just hit a dead end. Details ahead. Plus, one of the NFL's most storied rivalries is set for renewal this weekend when the Ravens and Steelers meet in Pittsburgh. We have all that and more coming up. Thanks for waking up with the Morning Vault, where you get the most important Ravens news in about 15 minutes. All right, Bobby, so you recently went on 104.3 The Fan in Denver leading up to that Ravens-Broncos game, and I'm hearing you had a chance to play catch-up with a familiar face. Yeah, Sarah, former Ravens defensive end Derek Wolf, of course, retired from football before the start of this season after 10 years in the NFL, the last two of which were in Baltimore, even though he was sidelined for all of 2021, like we mentioned. Anyways, Derek is now the co-host of a drive time show on the fan where his playing career began as a Bronco. And while I was technically invited on to be the interviewee, I sort of had to kind of flip the script and ended up interviewing Derek since no one in the market had really chatted with him after his ugly exit from the Ravens that came to a halt with an injury settlement. All right, so you've compiled multiple clips that we'll share one by one, but let's first begin with how he currently views this Ravens organization. You know, I mean, ownership over there is awesome. And the front office You is, can feel it? Yeah, their front office is like, they care about you. You know, Eric DaCosta is one of, the, one of the best GMs I've ever been around, you know. I've I've been around a ton of them, but, you know, as far as, you know, caring about his players and wanting, wanting what's best for his players... And putting the players first, mm-hmm. that's what he's about. They, and it, like their, their motto over there is that it's about the players. Like, f- players are the ones that win the football games. Yeah, partner, spoiler alert here. He doesn't have any bad blood with the front office or ownership. What he takes issue with is the strength and conditioning department. But that obviously wasn't something I was previously aware of. So this next clip begins with his answer to my question about what led the defensive coordinator Wink Martindale's departure last year, something that all of us have been curious about. But then listen to the completely different direction Derek takes things in. And that's the thing. I don't know. I feel like he got blamed for all the injuries somehow. It's so weird, man. I don't even, like, I could get into it and tell you what I think is going on over there and why they're always so injured. I think it has a lot to do with, you know, who's running the weight room. And that was Mm -hmm. my beef. I've never had beef with a strength coach ever in my life. Those are usually my favorite guys. You know, yeah. and that was, he was ultimately the reason why I couldn't play football anymore. I was going to say, how's that hip doing now? It's doing, it's doing good. I was able to, you know, when you when you get out of the league and you're not worried about PED tests, you could take things that, you, you know, different kind of peptides and Dude, stuff. Dude, what are you kidding? If if the Ravens needed a guy for like three weeks in the playoffs, throw a couple dollar bills under Derek's nose. He's good for 20 plays. <laughs> Let me say this too, because you you were dragged by by this fan base. Uh, to me, oh, you were. Oh, were you really? Oh, oh yeah. Why they dragged? Because they didn't. You know why? Because John Harbaugh. You know why? It's because Harbaugh got up there and was like, "I don't know what's going on with Wolf." When he knew damn well what was going on, was he implying you were soft? I don't know. He was implying that I just didn't want to play football when I was doing everything I possibly could to get back on the field. I was two weeks away from getting back on the field. They put me in the weight room with that strength coach. And I couldn't walk again couldn't walk i was dragging my leg around again after i got a stem cell after i got stem cell therapy i got epidurals on my back i did everything i could to get back on the field and then all they had to do was wait for two more weeks of me and i was training i was just doing my own program because his program didn't work for it just didn't work for me i was a 11 year vet 10 year vet man like i don't need that kind of like the crazy stuff you got going on here like it's not gonna work for me oh okay bobby there's a lot to unpack here first and foremost i think we can both agree that wink I don't think he was the one blamed for last year's injuries. It's our understanding that the partnership had just run its course. He and John were going different ways. And we all know that Wink hopes to be an NFL head coach one day. 
And things in the coaching ranks here in Baltimore with John Harbaugh at the top, they're not expected to change anytime soon in Baltimore. So with that said, the biggest takeaway from what I just heard is that Derek, without specifically naming him, is essentially claiming that Raven strength and conditioning coach Steve Saunders is the reason he had to shut down his playing career. Bobby, that's a big claim. Yeah, that's absolutely the takeaway. And while it's a serious takeaway and one that should be treated as such, we should mention that it's also an allegation. Now, you might remember that the last time Saunders found himself in the spotlight was during the 2020 pandemic season when the team suspended him for not following protocols, which may have ultimately led to that infamous COVID-19 outbreak in which around 30 players and staffers tested positive over a two-week span. That was insane. But back to Derek, because he found himself in the middle of some drama this offseason when he was seen carrying a bear in the midst of rehabbing his hip. So, Derek, pull, peel back the curtain for me, if you will, though, because I think what put it over the edge, and you're right, the hardball comment, I remember that. that well, no, it was me carrying a bear down a mountain. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, what? So, but but people don't understand is that I had, I had the surgery. I did six months of rehab, and I had to ma- I had to sh- I had to get my uh, the left side sh- or the right side strong enough to support my weight and like prove like prove to the doctors and stuff that I could handle doing the other one because they can't do them both at the same time. And you're just being a wheelchair, and you'll never hear this heal this heal right. Okay. So then he goes he goes after six or seven months, we're going to do the left side. So this that was two weeks before I did the left side. So I was at like, I was feeling really good, you know, like I was feeling like strong and good. I was doing rehab twice a day, like I was doing everything I possibly could. And then ultimately, he said, "I don't like." After he looked looked in there and did all the cleaning up, he was like, "If you keep playing, your hips are going to be repl- so both of them what, have to be replaced." What point a, was there a, a photo of, of you carrying a bear down the mountain? <laughs> I put it on. I put it online, and people killed you for that. Yeah, and I was like, I don't care. People oh, are going to be mad good. about it. They could be mad all they want, but I, they don't know what I was going through. They don't know what how, you're what I was trying to do to get out there. Season too, right? Exactly. Like I did everything to At get back point, and healthy, right? And I had to that do another what, surgery April? regardless, so it didn't matter. The right side was already what healed. Was I, yeah, March, the left. Listen, that? the labrum was already ripped off the bone on the left side. The right side was healed. It didn't matter what I did. Couldn't hurt it any worse. And finally, there were some within the Ravens fan base. We both know this, Sarah. They were convinced that Derek had given up on the team and was just mailing it in to grab an injury settlement. That was that wasn't my that was not what I was doing. Like I wasn't trying to collect the check. Like that's not my in my nature. Like I was there to play football and play at a high level, man. Like that's what I wanted to do. And then, you know, the other, you know, Joe Collin being out of there, like, you know, I don't know. It was just I I felt very like odd man out that they made me feel like the odd that, man out. but that's my point so while i totally understand where fans were coming from with some of their frustrations with derek after the bear photo made its rounds thanks to my tweet you know when i was actually on twitter partner and not suspended <laughs> elon wherever you are i'm ready for my reinstatement but the, every player at the same time right every player is entitled to his off season and who are we to question a guy who had been medically cleared to participate in such an activity Now, as for his allegation aimed at Saunders, all I can really say is I respect Derek's integrity. I've gotten to know him personally over the years. And I truly hope, though, at the same time, that when John Harbaugh vowed to take a thorough look at his organizational operation from the top down at his end-of-season press conference last year, I hope he stood by his word. What about you, partner? What's your reaction to all this? I'm just more trying to take it all in here, Bobby, but I will say this. There are always two sides to every story. And that was shown again here, right? As Wolf cleared up the timing of various surgeries and what he was going through, what was going on with the bear, all of it. He kind of cleared that up. And knowing this new information, some fans may not have been as angry with him had they known this information. So it's my guess that Steve Saunders has a side to this story too. Whether he ever tells that side, I don't know. But right now, we only have one side. All right, and still to come here on The Vault, Stanford football has narrowed its head coaching vacancy search, and Greg Roman? Yeah, he didn't make the cut. So much to the disappointment of some Ravens fans within this fan base, Greg Roman's candidacy for the head coaching vacancy at Stanford, Sarah, it's no longer. 
Yeah, according to the Athletics' Stuart Mandel, Roman is completely out of the running after some initial talks. Now, the school also talked to former BYU and Virginia head coach Bronco Mendenhall and former Ravens coach and Denver Broncos head coach Vic Fangio. They're both also out. That leaves former Dallas Cowboys head coach Jason Garrett and Sacramento State coach Troy Taylor as the two finalists for the job. You know, it's kind of an interesting note that both Roman and John Harbaugh have been up against Garrett for head coaching jobs, right? Like, if you remember back in the day, Steve Bashotti initially offered the Ravens head coaching gig to Garrett back in 2008, but Garrett decided to stay in Dallas. And now, here we are over a decade later, He's being considered ahead of Roman now, full circle in this industry. <laughs> yeah, it's always interesting how these things go. And Bobby, we don't know all the reasoning behind Stanford's decision to take Roman out of the running, but the way this Ravens offense has performed over the last month certainly didn't help. And once news broke that he was a candidate, it was just a couple of days later that Roman went on and called one of his worst play calls that I can remember as a Ravens coordinator. You remember this one. And off Duvernay, it goes off to Crochet, going deep, looking in the end zone, intercepted a second time. Justin Simmons with the end zone pick. Yeah, thanks for the reminder there, partner. <laughs> Given how the offense, though, has performed, uh, this news will not stop the cries for change from continuing whatsoever, I would imagine. Yeah, no, it definitely won't. And I thought Jeff Zrebeck answered well a question from a fan that asked if Roman really deserves all the hate that he gets. And Zrebeck replied as such, quote, I get the hate to an extent. The offense sure does look like it's hit a wall within his system. Issues with situational play calling, etc. But plenty of it is over the top, too. Roman's done some good things in his tenure. When they've played well, it's all LJ. When they've struggled, it's all Roman, close quote. And I'll leave you with this thought, Bobby. Even if the Ravens still do part ways with Roman, it's possible that they just hire another offensive coordinator with the same philosophy. And that's why so many people were nervous about Willie Taggart's visit to the team's facility, which we talked about in Thursday's episode, because he runs a similar offense. So to me, the question going forward isn't just whether Roman stays or goes. It's, will the Ravens look for a coordinator that would usher in a new offensive system? All right, Bobby, nothing says Raven Steelers quite like this statistic. Since 2008, the storied in-division rivalry has seen the most games decided by three or fewer points, with 16 total contests going down to the wire. The next closest rivalry only has 11 such games. Sarah, we mentioned it in our game preview episode ahead of this one. Like those Hall of Fame personalities that made this rivalry what it was may no longer be around, but it still packs a punch. And every single player understands what it means, including Ravens linebacker Patrick Queen. I still consider myself not fully a Raven because I, I'm more for against the Steelers. Like, yeah, I made a play here and there, but I haven't beat the Steelers. So I think that's the real true mantra around here is until you beat the Steelers, you're not a Raven. So everybody know what this game is. It's the most physical game you're going to play all season, and you play it twice. They know what you do. We know what they do. The players, they all know about the uh, rivalry, whether they're new, old. Everybody comes in from a new team, and they come to these two teams, they're like, we know about the rivalry. So uh, it's just it's a game that you know it's going to come down to the last play. It's a physical game. Uh, it's just who, who's going to bow down first, honestly. So Pittsburgh's had the edge over Baltimore in four straight, which have been decided by a combined 13 points. In the John Harbaugh era, if you were wondering, the Ravens are 14 and 17 overall. That does include the playoffs and all time. 23 and 29. So they got a little bit of work to do. I actually was wondering that. Thank you. I was looking for that stat earlier today. But Bobby, the Harbaugh era began almost one year to the day after Mike Tomlin's era began in Pittsburgh in 2007, making the pair the second and third longest tenured NFL head coaches league wide behind the great Bill Belichick. Yeah. And this week 14 matchup marks the 32nd meeting between the two head coaches, which also includes the playoffs. So come game time, all of those head to head battles will be the second most by a pair of opposing head coaches in league history. The only head coaches in NFL history to produce more Curly Lambeau 
and George Hollis, who did so 49 times. So these guys are going to have to stick around for a few more years. <laughs> yeah, consistency, longevity, grit, tradition. We could go on and on about what makes this rivalry what it is. But more so than anything else, it's about the players. And one player who's expected to play a huge role for Baltimore is obviously backup quarterback Tyler Huntley, who will more than likely start under center in place of an injured Lamar Jackson Sunday. And so we're not going to seek comfort or find comfort in the fact that we've been in the stadium with him before. Last year's exposure for him, probably more than anything, just tells us we better be prepared for a guy that's significantly better. When you've played and you've had experience and you're no longer speculating, he's not speculating what it's like to be in the stadium against the Pittsburgh Steelers. He has that experience in his hip pocket. And so we better assume that he's going to be significantly better in the same ways that we're not surprised that Kenny's getting better with each opportunity. Every week you guys ask me how and why Kenny's getting better. Exposure. And, and, I, and, I, and I could say the same thing about their quarterback play and the experience that he gained from a year ago. And so that's our mentality. Uh, we have been in the stadium with them, but we're not, we're not finding comfort in that. We're preparing to see a much better guy, a more experienced guy, a guy – that's learned from that exposure. The always eloquent Mike Tomlin during his media session earlier this week. But here's a refresher on what happened a year ago on January 9th, the game that he was alluding to inside MT Bank Stadium. Heartbreak basically is what went down, right? Chris Boswell <laughs> converted a 36 yard field goal to lift Pittsburgh past Baltimore 16 to 13 in overtime. It was the regular season finale for the 2021 campaign. Tyler Huntley completed 16 of the 31 passes he threw for 141 yards and two interceptions. He also ran for 72 yards on 72 carries, but it wasn't enough. So yeah, the Ravens have dropped four straight against their rival. That's the reality coming into this one. And Sarah, based on how Mark Andrews handled his media session this week, I think he's about as locked in as it gets right now. There's no time for nonsense in 89's life. Mark, it's Pittsburgh week. Does a locker room get up that much more for a game like this? We're excited about it. Yeah, yeah we're excited. So the Steelers have won four straight in the rivalry. Is that a talking point this week and something that is kind of inspiring guys this week? Uh, yeah, we know. We know. We're excited about the game. And before we fly, some other quick news items you need to know beginning with an odd debate that apparently took over the Ravens' locker room after practice Thursday. Marlon Humphrey explains via a video posted by the Baltimore Sun's Jonah Schaefer. Oh, can you tell us about the debate that's tearing this locker room apart? Uh, <laughs> talking about uh, one gorilla versus 100 humans. And I said it depends on what type of guys you got. And then I started thinking, even no matter what the guys you had, I don't know how you take down a gorilla. Do you choke it out? Do you... All I know is that we could be the gorillas and the Steelers be the humans. I think we got a good chance Sunday. So we're, we're, we're trying to be gorillas this Sunday. And uh, I don't think this argument is ending anytime soon. So uh, it'll, it'll probably go for a while. Also, Mark Andrews revealed that it was Steve Smith Sr. who inspired his decision to wear number 89. Hayden, I took my 81 and I was thinking about, you know, what, what number I wanted to be. And, uh, you know, Steve Smith was a guy that stuck out to me. The way he played, his energy, his attitude, I loved it. So that's why. And finally, Jeff Zrebeck of The Athletic. Well, he wonders if something is wrong injury-wise with both Devin DuVernay and Gus Edwards. He said DuVernay doesn't look as explosive or as confident as he usually does with the ball in his hands. And you may remember he opted out of returning opportunities and he also hasn't gotten around the corner as quickly as he normally does. Then Zrebeck also said... Gus looks more tentative hitting the holes in the line and has had zero or negative yards on two of his runs the last couple of games. We all know that's not characteristic of Gus Bus, who's returning from both offseason knee surgery and a hamstring injury earlier this season. Thanks for listening to the Morning Ravens Vault, a podcast unaffiliated with the team. We created our show to keep you plugged into all things Ravens. If you've been enjoying our content, please tap that follow button and share it with a friend. Don't forget, you can also catch us on YouTube by searching Raven's Vault Podcast. And we'd love to hear from you with comments, questions, or if you'd be interested in advertising with us. You can reach us by email via BaltimoreRavensVault at gmail.com. So that's all the time we've got today, but be sure to check our official game preview episode ahead of this weekend's Ravens-Steelers matchup. <laughs>